Hello and welcome to another episode of Reading Together from Seaharp Press. I'm Eugene Lunning, co-founder of Seaharp, and I'm so delighted to be continuing our journey today in The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. This is part of our timeless series at Seaharp, so I'd encourage you to go to seaharp.com and get a copy if you'd like to follow along page by page. Well, on Reading Together, as you know, we simply read together pausing here and there to think of perhaps scripture or a deep pondering from some other work. So we're going to be in chapter two, and I've mentioned this before, I'm splitting these chapters into two parts each just simply because they're kind of long. So we're going to be starting on the Sea Harp edition on page 27. This is chapter two. This chapter is called The Blessedness of Possessing Nothing. And the frontispiece quotation is from Matthew 5 verse, let's see, 3 which says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's dive in. Before the Lord God made man upon the earth, he first prepared for him by creating a world of useful and pleasant things for his sustenance and delight. In the Genesis account of the creation, these are called simply things. They were made for man's uses, but they were meant always to be external to the man and subservient to him. In the deep heart of the man was a shrine where none but God was worthy to come. Within him was God, without a thousand gifts which God had showered upon him. I'm going to pause there. What a simple and yet stunning thought. The idea that all of creation really exists in things. Uh, This almost sounds like an early Stoic writing, but it's mid-1940s from A.W. Tozer. It's the idea that my inner world is a place where God, as it's described here, has a a shrine, a place to be and to exist as the Godhead, right here. And external to me, or as Tozer says it, without, there are a thousand or ten thousand or ten million things which may be subservient to me, may be a blessing to me, but to a degree they have nothing to do with this, the place where God chooses to dwell, uh, that place in which he wants to commune with me or abide in me, as you know we love that language. So just to get that in front of you, that's the image here. We were created with things all around us on a varying scale of utility or interest, but again, none of it really matters to this. This is between me and him. I'll keep reading. But sin has introduced complications and has made those very gifts of God a potential source of ruin to the soul. Our woes began when God was forced out of his central shrine and things were allowed to enter. Within the human heart, things have taken over. Men have now by nature no peace within their hearts, for God is crowned there no longer. But there in the moral dusk, stubborn and aggressive usurpers fight among themselves for first place on the throne. This is not a mere metaphor, but an accurate analysis of our real spiritual trouble. There is within the human heart a tough, fibrous root of fallen life whose nature is to possess, always to possess. It covets things with a deep and fierce passion. The pronouns my and mine look innocent enough in print, but their constant and universal use is significant. They express the real nature of the old Adamic, meaning like things of Adam, the first man, the old Adamic man, better than a thousand volumes of theology could do. They are verbal symptoms of our deep disease. The roots of our hearts have grown down into things, and we dare not pull up one little rootlet lest we die. Things have become necessary to us, a development never originally intended. God's gifts Now take the place of God, and the whole course of nature is upset by this monstrous substitution. Now, 
I want to make clear here that Tozer is not creating sort of a dialectic of spiritual and material where all material things are evil. He's not saying that. What he's saying, I'll give an illustration. Uh, right now, my daughter is about to turn 16. I have an old beloved truck, and she's going to take over my truck. It's going to be the car that is hers when she's got her license. So of late, I've been thinking about what car I'm going to get next, and you know, not just guys. I know there's lots of ladies out there. We, cars are interesting. But I've been fascinated lately at the degree to which my thoughts have started sort of like circulating around that car. What's it going to be? How am I going to look in it? Oh, are people going to like it if they see me driving it? This thing, which is a nice utilitarian thing, I get around in this thing, has started to take like root in my heart. I think about it some days, probably more than I think about serving others or thinking about abiding in Jesus. So let's just use me as an example. That thing, which could be a material blessing from the Lord, something that is useful, that allows me to serve him, is trying to invert the equation. It's trying to become more interesting than him, to push the Lord God off of his throne in my heart. And this is just a one dumb thing in my life. I, I offer it to you by way of example. The material world is not of itself evil. I'm sitting here in a chair and there's a lamp shining some light on me. But if these things surmount the Lord in my heart, if I'm so possessed by being a consumer in the American way of life that I don't really think about the other people around me, I, I don't go about my life in such a way as to honor the will of the Lord, well, then these things simply have to go. They are finite. Frankly, sometimes they're kind of silly. And he is the absolutely unchanging God who loves me and who has saved me and who has made me for higher things. So that's what Tozer is getting at here. And I don't want you to think he's being too hard-nosed in terms of the world around us. But let's keep going. We'll hear more of his argument. Our Lord referred to this tyranny of things when he said to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. Breaking this truth into fragments for our better understanding, it would seem that there is within each of us an enemy which we tolerate at our peril. Jesus called it life and self, or as we would say, the self-life. Its chief characteristic is its possessiveness. The words gain and profit suggest this. To allow this enemy to live, it, it, to live is, in the end, to lose everything. To repudiate it and give up all for Christ's sake is to lose nothing at last, but to preserve everything unto life eternal. And possibly, also a hint is given here as to the only effective way to destroy this foe. It is by the cross. Let him take up his cross and follow me. I'll take it even a step further. It is, of course, to like imagine yourself gazing upon the cross of Jesus, like looking upon him as we're told to do, to consider the cross, to take it to heart and to remember that you and I have been crucified with him. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That's a beautiful remembrance. But did you notice that there's an actual active verb there? Take up your cross. I think often of that man, Simon of Cyrene, who's standing by the side of the road as Jesus goes towards Calvary and is drawn into this moment. Help that man. So he comes out of the crowd and literally gets under the crossbeam and helps Jesus up the way. That man took up a cross. It's to be the same for us. We are to gaze upon the cross of Jesus and we are to realize that this self-life needs to kind of go away. It needs to go away once and for all, and it needs to continue to be taken away. But what I love about that image of taking up your cross, being aware of the self-death that we require, is that when you take something up, especially a big cross like Simon of Cyrene did, it's going to take both your hands. It's going to take 
your energy, your strength, your muscles, your will. When our hands are full taking up the cross, we become far less interested in the material things around us, those things that are trying to choke out the inner life with God. So the more active we are staring at the cross and taking it up, the less we'll have regard for these silly things around us that are trying to have more of an effect than sometimes we give them credit for. I'll keep reading. The way to deeper knowledge of God is through the lonely valleys of soul poverty and abnegation of all things. The blessed ones who possess the kingdom are they who have repudiated every external thing and have rooted from their hearts all sense of possessing. These are the poor in spirit. They have reached an inward state paralleling the outward circumstances of the common beggar in the streets of Jerusalem. That is what the word poor, as Christ used it, actually means. These blessed poor are no longer slaves to the tyranny of things. They have broken the yoke of the oppressor. And this they have done not by fighting, but by surrendering. Though free from all sense of possessing, they yet possess all things. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let me exhort you to take this seriously. It is not to be understood as mere Bible teaching to be stored away in the mind along with an inert mass of other doctrines. It is a marker on the road to greener pastures, a path chiseled against the steep sides of the Mount of God. We dare not try to bypass it if we would follow on in this holy pursuit. We must ascend a step at a time. If we refuse one step, we bring our progress to an end. And I'll start right there and then move backwards. That is the heart, and I often talk about this, of the nature of repentance. Yes, today we might have already fallen on our faces with regard to the material world. We might have had, let's say, a lustful thought. Or we might have coveted that thing that we saw... Like I talked about before, you see somebody driving a new car and you're like, I want that. Well, we've essentially stopped our progress in releasing those material things. But the beauty of the heart of Jesus is that he always invites us, when we've stopped that progress, to start again. And how? By simply confessing it. Saying, I'm sorry for that thought. I'm sorry for that desire. Jesus, would you get me going again? Would you help me to take the one step at a time, up that holy mount toward those greener pastures. And now I'm going to go back because I was fascinated by his description of the common beggar in the streets of Jerusalem. Just this last Sunday at our gathering on Sundays called The Anchor, we talked about the man sitting in Acts 3 with his, you know, we imagine him with a bowl, waiting and asking everyone that walks by, please, something. And here comes Peter and John, filled with the Holy Spirit. They say, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, in the name of Jesus, walk! Do you see that language I just used? It's the language John and Peter used on that day. Silver and gold I don't have. They are saying, we don't have the things you think you need. But what we do have, what we possess, we will give you. What did they possess? The Spirit of Jesus. That spirit by which they could speak his name and set a man free of his physical lameness. But also, you can imagine, especially as you read into Acts 4, he, that man, gets brought to the trial as well. That man is set free by Jesus entirely. Friends, that is our job. Not to get tangled up with the things of life, but to be so free that we can set other people free. How do we help them to possess it? We possess it. And I'll even go a step further with my semantics. We are possessed. Let me keep reading. As is frequently true, this New Testament principle of spiritual life finds its best illustration in the Old Testament. In the story of Abraham and Isaac, we have a dramatic picture, and I will say a very dramatic picture, of the surrendered life, as well as an excellent commentary on that first beatitude. Abraham was old when Isaac was born, old enough indeed to have been his grandfather, 
And the child became at once the delight and, listen to this word, word, idol of his heart. From that moment, when he first stooped to take the tiny form awkwardly in his arms, he was an eager love slave of his son. God went out of his way to comment on the strength of this affection. And it is not hard to understand. The baby represented everything sacred to his father's heart. The promises of God, the covenants, the hopes of the years, and the long messianic dream. As he watched him grow from babyhood to young manhood, the heart of the old man was knit closer and closer with the life of his son till at last the relationship bordered upon the perilous. It was then that God stepped in to save both father and son from the consequences of an uncleansed love. Now this is a very kind of interesting, subtle point. What are we getting here from Abraham? His eyes were upon, and Tozer tells us, the promises of God, the covenants, the hopes of the years, and the long messianic dream. I mean, friends, if there's four high and holy things, those are them. Promises of God, covenants, hope, and the long messianic dream, looking toward Jesus from back in the Old Testament times. That's amazing. But what, by looking at baby and then young man Isaac, had Abraham begun to do? He had begun to look at that fulfillment of the promise, of the covenants, of the hopes, of that way by which the Messiah would come. He had begun to look at physical Isaac as himself the everything. He had taken his eyes off of the Lord God and put them upon the Lord God's blessing. And in that moment, his heart was after the thing and not the one who'd given him the thing. That's the subtlety of what Tozer's trying to tell us. Let's keep reading. Take now thy son, said God to Abraham, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. The sacred writer spares us a close-up of the agony that night on the slopes near Beersheba, when the aged man had it out with his God. But respectful imagination may view in awe the bent form and convulsive wrestling alone under the stars. Possibly not again until a greater than Abraham wrestled in the Garden of Gethsemane did such mortal pain visit a human soul. If only the man himself might have been allowed to die, that would have been easier a thousand times, for he was old now, and to die would have been no great ordeal for one who had walked so long with God. Besides, it would have been a last sweet pleasure to let his dimming vision rest upon the figure of his stalwart son who would live to carry on the Abrahamic line and fulfill in himself the promises of God made long before in Ur of the Chaldees. How should he slay the lad? Even if he could get the consent of his wounded and protesting heart, how could he reconcile the act with the promise in Isaac shall thy seed be called. This was Abraham's trial by fire, and he did not fail in the crucible. While the stars still shone like sharp white points above the tent where the sleeping Isaac lay, and long before the gray dawn had begun to lighten the east, the old saint had made up his mind. He would offer his son as God had directed him to do, and then trust God to raise him from the dead. This, says the writer to the Hebrews, was the solution his aching heart found sometime in the dark night. And he rose early in the morning to carry out the plan. It is beautiful to see that, while he erred as to God's method, he had correctly sensed the secret of his, meaning God's, great heart. And the solution accords well with the New Testament scripture. Whosoever will lose for my sake shall find. And friends, I'm actually going to stop there. That's going to be about the midpoint of chapter two of this book. But before I close, 
I just want to say, you know, I'm recording this in 2023, and I hear even not pastors, I hear philosophers often refer to this moment and talk about sort of the absurdity of this act, and in fact, the cruelty of it. And I get that. It absolutely looks cruel that Abraham is about to take his son and have a knife in his hand. It's horrific. But when we look at that last pair of paragraphs, where does Abraham source his confidence? Where does he get that sense that, yeah, if anything, God will raise him from the dead? It's right back here. It's on page 31 of our edition. It says, To die would have been, for Abraham, no great ordeal for one who had walked so long with God. Friends, it is out of our intimacy with God that we are able to carry out those acts of obedience that sometimes seem wild, crazy, absurd. But to those who have a heart connection with their father, it's simply the same thing as if I was talking to my middle son or my youngest son, Tripp or Hoyt, and I asked them to do something for me, something simple, but something that I knew was going to connect our hearts. So I'm going to break off there for this part one of chapter two of The Pursuit of God. But as we pick up in our next episode, we're going to be finishing out that narrative about Abraham and Isaac. And I think it's pretty beautiful where Tozer is about to take us. So just by way of reminder, we are in The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. And I'm so thankful that you would join me on reading together as we continue our way through some of the great classics of the church. Thanks for being with me. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.